ever a text for the study of Lord Jesus Christ as mediator uh, that was pretty much made for this study it would be Philippians chapter 2 and I'll be referencing that uh, throughout this study uh, y'all are probably wondering why I'm up here instead of down here I actually left my USB stick uh, with the PowerPoint presentation that I usually have sitting on my desk so that's a little bit of a change all right, so we're studying our statement of faith, and uh, this week will be part two regarding the statement, uh, statement number seven, concerning the mediator. And the statement reads like this, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is the divinely appointed mediator between God and man, having taken, having taken upon himself human nature, yet without sin, he perfectly fulfilled the law, suffered and died upon the cross for the salvation of those sinners the Father gave to him. He was buried and rose again the third day and ascended to his Father, at whose right hand he ever lived to make intercession for his people. He is the only mediator, the prophet, priest and king of his people, and sovereign of the universe. It's a big statement. There's a lot there. Uh, I would love to have had maybe two or three months <laughs> to deal with the entirety uh, of, this, of this, uh, this statement and the scripture upon which it's based, uh, but um, this is just a survey, so um, two weeks uh, should be enough to survey the whole of the, the, uh, the statement. Well, last week I covered, there's four sentences in total uh, in regards to this statement, and I, I broke it up, broke up the statement into three parts, uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we talk about the mediator, if you remember, the, de the definition for the word itself is one who acts as a guarantee so as to secure something which is otherwise unattainable. Okay? And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. Uh, he's obtained salvation for us. He's redeemed us before a just and holy God. We are a fallen generation, right? And the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed us. He has, uh, he has gained something for us that was unattainable uh, on our own. And so, <clears throat> when we see the word mediator being used uh, in regards to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we need to understand that He is the only mediator that we have. And as, as, as sinful human beings, uh, He has guaranteed a favorable, favorable position before Creator God, whom we have deeply offended um, and rejected in time past as a result of sin. Well, the first sentence, you remember, is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is the divinely appointed mediator between God and man. You remember we said the, the phrase only begotten signifies a unique and endearing relationship that is between the Father and His Son. John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The relationship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is such that only the only begotten Son of God can complete the mediation between created, uh, Creator God and created man according to the perfect will of the Godhead. Well, the second uh, part that we dealt with last week was uh, was this, having taken upon himself human nature, yet without sin, he perfectly fulfilled the law, suffered and died upon the cross for the salvation of those sinners the Father gave to him. The work of the Savior on earth, beginning with the incarnation, is essential to the Godhead's plan of redemption. And without the work of the Savior, his mediatorial reign would be non-existent making our redemption impossible. And we find 
Uh, we find this in Galatians chapter 4, starting with verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The Lord Jesus Christ lived perfectly. He lived righteously. And He lived in communion with God His Father. He never caused a divide between Himself and the other two persons of the Trinity. A divide was never caused. That cannot be said about man. There is a divide between sinful man and righteous, holy God. And that divide is the result of sin. A result of rejection of His moral law and His created purpose for us. And this means that since the Lord Jesus Christ uniquely kept all righteousness, all law, right? There was never any divide between Himself and His Father and the Holy Spirit. But that means that He is uniquely qualified to go before the Father's heavenly throne on our behalf. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, and of course he's talking about Adam there, so by the obedience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. Okay? So the Lord Jesus Christ, in the position as, as the Son of God and the Son of Man, fully God and fully man, He's uniquely able to uh, mediate on our behalf, gain that unattainable thing, which is forgiveness before a righteous and holy God. Well, we also talked about last week that in a final act of obedience in His life on this earth, the Lord Jesus Christ ensured, he ensured that He would be the one and only mediator between Almighty God and His creation. And Romans, again looking to Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 8. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were, <clears throat> for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. All right, that's... That's what we went over uh, last week. And as I continued to <coughs> consider these things over this past week, I was struck with the fact that, I, I know I've been guilty of this in the past, but I think this can be said, since I'm not special, this can be said about a great many others. I think that modern Christendom can be guilty of separating the gospel, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, what I believe and how I live, from the reality in which we live. Does that make sense? We separate the truth that Christ really did come. He really did live, live perfectly as, as not only our Redeemer, but our example he lived, He died. He shed His blood, that atoning work on the cross. He appeased the wrath of God on our behalf. And then He defeated death. And sometimes I think that we live, uh, maybe not consciously, but in this, this weird fog of uh, disillusion. Um, in that uh, sometimes we think of this as just a story. I know I've been guilty of that. And so when we read the Gospel, we read Scripture, we kind of find ourselves just reading it. Oh, yeah, that's right. You know, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, let's, let's move on to what I have for the rest of my day. And, and there's this separation. And I'm not saying that this is done purposefully, but it's important that we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ really did come. God incarnate really did come in time and space, at a certain point in time, in a certain place, He lived, He died, He rose again. 
It's, under, it's important to understand this as historical fact. All right? He, he, the Savior did minister among His creation at a very real point in time. And I'm going to, just, just to kind of, if, the, if, the, if Scripture is not enough to do it for you, there are historians that lived <clears throat> during the first century that wrote about the truth that Christ lived and He did die and that He even rose again. Uh, Flavius, uh, Josephus, and most of you uh, know him simply as Josephus. Uh, he lived uh, in the first century, and he wrote this. Concern, he wrote a history, uh, a history of the Hebrews, and, and within that history, he writes this: About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man. Now, listen to this. This is interesting because I don't think that Josephus ever did. He ever claim to be a Christian? I don't think that he did. I've never read that he did. I, I, I couldn't find anywhere that he did. So here's a Hebrew. He, he's not a believer, and this is what he writes. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Messiah. And of course, that leads me to believe that, that he doesn't really understand what the gospel is because he would have said he is the Messiah. But, and when, carrying on in the same quote, and when upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had condemned him to a cross, those who had first come to love him did not cease. He appeared to them, spending a third day restored to life, for the prophets of God had foretold these things and a thousand other marvels about him. And the tribe of the Christians so called after him has still to this day not disappeared. This was written in A.D. 93. This screams to me that the Lord Jesus Christ continued, continues to reign. He continues to guide his church and his people. He continues to reveal himself. And the tribe of the Christians so called after him has still to this day not disappeared. And that truth can still be said today. And it's a direct result of the mediatorial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, <clears throat> I thought that was important. I think it's important that we don't separate the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? I think that's, 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 that's very important. We understand the Lord Jesus Christ as the second person of the Godhead who came to this earth in the flesh. It's important that we don't separate those two and that we understand those two things. Well, especially as we study uh, His mediatorial reign. Well, all right, the third sentence. I'm dealing with this with sentence by sentence. So the third sentence in this uh, in the statement reads like this. He was buried and rose again the third day and ascended to his Father, at whose right hand he ever lives to make intercession for his people. It's important that we talk about the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, sometimes I think maybe it gets lost in the mix of, of all the events that happened. The Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross. Very significant. Very significant. There is no salvation without this work okay, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He rose again from the dead. Again, if we served a dead Savior, we'd be serving nothing. This would all be for nothing. Highly important to the Gospel. He was buried. That is also a very important concept within the Gospel story. Why? All of the Gospels give record of the Lord's burial. All four of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give record of this. Which is significant. Because the Gospels are written from different perspectives 
All right? And there are only certain things within the Gospels that all four of them reference. And one of those is that Christ was buried. This is a big deal. Did you know that most individuals in Roman times that were crucified were never buried? Never buried. They were either left to rot on the cross or they were thrown in a lime pit, but they were never buried. Their bodies were meant to warn others against the same acts that the guilty party had been crucified for. That's pretty brutal, isn't it? And it actually is very common throughout history that either the bodies of criminals and dissenters are left to rot and hang, or they're not buried at all, or burned. There, there's, there's a bunch of different, uh, different ways that bodies were desecrated. But the Lord Jesus Christ's body was not desecrated. It was not left there to rot. It was not left there to, if anybody's ever been to the Middle East, they understand that, that dogs over there run rampant. And most people in the Middle East don't have dogs as pets. Maybe the rich have a little, you know, lap dog. But dogs are wild. They run rabid over there and uh, they, they, they scavenge. And this would be what happened on Golgotha. Dogs would start to come as people left to take parts of, those who had been crucified. It's pretty gruesome. But this didn't happen to the Savior. Matthew chapter 27, verse 59 through 60, And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new... Or, I'm sorry, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And then in John chapter 19, starting in verse 38, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with spices, as in the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, Therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the, sepulcher was, uh, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. This is important. Because his burial, the Lord Jesus Christ's burial, leads the reader of the Gospel accounts to understand that his resurrection happened bodily. For there to be a resurrection, there has to be an empty tomb very quickly within the church's history gnostics began to talk about a, a spiritual resurrection right but there's an empty tomb if it were simply a spiritual resurrection there wouldn't be an empty tomb we could go visit today all right there'd be there'd still be a body there but he rose. His, his body was uh, risen from the dead. Matthew chapter 28, verse 5. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, 
and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. To the Jew, with maybe the exception of the Sadducee, anything other than bodily resurrection was absolutely absurd. He was buried to rise again. And we see the emphasis of an empty tomb. The Lord defeated death bodily, and then He bodily ascended to His Father in glory. C.H. Spurgeon said that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is not an allegory and a symbol, but it is reality. Now let it be known and understood that our faith is that those very limbs that lay stiff and cold in death became warm with life again. That the very body which lay there became instinct with life and came forth into a glorious existence. Jesus Christ has really risen from the dead. So we must understand that God gloriously exalted the Lord Jesus Christ beginning with His resurrection and that the Savior ascended into eternity to sit at the right hand of the Father and that He intercedes on our behalf on behalf of those whom the Father has given Him. In Acts chapter 1, verse, starting in verse 9, going through verse 11, we read, And when He had spoken these things, the Lord Jesus Christ, while they beheld the disciples, He was taken up, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The bodily resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is important because it signifies something to his followers. It signifies that in the same fashion that he was ascended, he'll come back again. And when he comes back again, guess what happens? All those who have passed, who have gone to sleep, who have died in the Lord Jesus Christ, will rise again and meet him in the air. And we too will ascend with the Lord Jesus Christ into glory to stand before our Creator. And He will advocate on our behalf as each one of us are judged. That's important. In Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The Lord Jesus Christ ascended to be with his Father and even now sits at his right hand. Romans chapter 8, verse 34, the Apostle Paul says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He intercedes on our behalf. This would not have happened if he was still in the tomb. This would not have happened if he hadn't risen from the dead. This would have not have happened if He didn't ascend to be with His Father and sit at His right hand. He makes intercession for us even now. 
so that when we sin, as the, as the Apostle John says in 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. Our desire is not to sin. Our desire is to live perfectly like our Savior. We want to emulate our Savior. We want to be more like our Savior every day. And if any man sin, we're going to sin. The assumption is that as long as we are in this flesh, in this fallen world, we will sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And He doesn't just say Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus Christ the righteous. He advocates on our behalf. And He can do so because He is righteous. All right. All right, this is the final... <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think there's something air bothering my throat. <clears throat> All right. This is the final verse. This is the fourth and final verse of the statement that we have in our statement of faith concerning the mediator. And this deals specifically with the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it reads like this. He is the only mediator, the prophet, priest and king of his people, and sovereign of the universe. Now before I get started, everything that has been said up until this point, all right, leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ's offices, okay? If he had not lived perfectly, if he had not uh, obeyed himself even to shed his own blood, all right? if He hadn't have risen again, if He is not interceding on our behalf, this sentence becomes useless. So everything that we've just said builds to this point. As I've stated previously, when we seek to understand what it means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man, we must first understand that all of redemptive history, all of redemptive history, falls under the mediatorial reign of the Savior. Therefore, when we speak of the Lord as prophet, priest, and king, and sovereign over all that is, it must be understood that these heavenly offices fall under the Savior's qualification as our mediator. It is His mediatorial reign. I believe that we do the Savior's position as mediator or disservice when we understand and act as if this position is simply a conduit for prayer. And I'm not saying that we cannot go boldly before the throne of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? But it's not, He's not simply a conduit for prayer, He's a conduit for all things concerning our relationship before God the Father. It is so much more than just a simple understanding of coming before the Lord Jesus or coming before the Father in prayer in Lord Jesus Christ's name. It's more than this. The Lord Jesus Christ reigns. The mediatorial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ is a whole of the redemptive covenant of grace at work both in time and space as well as in eternity. Okay. So let's, let's take each office, the prophet, the priest, and the king. And then we'll end with the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign of the universe. First, prophet. The biblical idea of prophet is not simply one who foretells that, that which is to come to pass. Okay? He's not a divine fortune teller. Okay? That's, in fact, when we look at Scripture and we look through the prophets, uh, we should not view them as merely eschatological or, or just talking about end times or future things. Okay? What we need to understand about a prophet is that they are specifically called and ordained by God to proclaim His word and will among men. That is a prophet. 
They are heaven-sent preachers. They are heaven-sent proclaimers. And they are heaven-sent spokesmen for God. We understand from Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ is the prophet. He is the great prophet. Okay? He is greater than all others that came before Him. In fact, in Acts chapter 3, verse 22, we read, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. He is the prophet of which all other prophets look forward to. He is the prophet... Uh, this, this is, that's not X. I'm sorry, that's my quote, and I put it in. in. <laughs> but I said this. <laughs> not the Bible. I said this. He is the prophet of which all other prophets look forward to. He is the prophet who reveals uh, to us uh, the Lord God most perfectly. Okay. The Lord Jesus Christ is that more perfect word sent by God to reveal to us by His Word and Spirit the will of God for our salvation in our lives. John chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, For the law was given by Mo Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen uh, God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. John chapter 6, verse 45 through 47. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The Lord Jesus Christ said about Himself that He was there to reveal the Father to His people. He is the perfect Word of God, the perfect revelation of God. He has revealed God's redemptive covenant to man. And as such, He is the perfect prophet. He has perfectly fulfilled that office. We need to understand that the Word of God is the Word of Christ Jesus. And the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God. That's why it's important to understand that we need to be careful in trying to separate the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they are so uniquely intertwined. If we were to separate his person from his work, we could not say that the word of God is the word of Christ, uh, is the word of Jesus Christ, and the spirit of Christ is the spirit of God. The two must go together. Colossians chapter three, verse sixteen through seventeen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 through 12, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto them by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The Lord Jesus Christ has revealed God's plan of salvation, His redemptive covenant to us. 
And He continues to do so through His Spirit. He continues to reveal Himself to us. Um, continues to reveal uh, those things that we need to repent of. Continues to reveal what we need to understand about Him. Continues to edify and sanctify us uh, through Scripture and the moving of the Holy Spirit within us. Well, <clears throat> it's also important that we understand the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills the office of priest. It is in the Old Testament that we see how the Levitical priesthood offered up sacrifices for the people of God and interceded on their behalf before God. They went into the, holies of, the Holy of Holies, right, to sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. In fact, the priests of the Old Testament were supposed to be the spokesmen of God. And it was only in the spiritual decline of Israel when they start there was there started to become the spiritual declination that we see that prophets are being raised up to give the give the people the word of God to call them to repentance but that in fact was the duty of the priest and they failed and they failed time and again. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, such books as Hosea, we see uh, the prophets decrying the fact that the priest, the Levitical priesthood had turned the true worship of God into something that was idolatrous. They had, they had perverted it. All right? And the, the prophets called for the priest to repent. They called for the people of Israel to repent. But the priests were those who were to intercede on the behalf of the people before God. The Lord Jesus Christ, He is the one that executed the office of priest by once offering Himself up as a perfect atoning sacrifice for the people of God. In Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 24, and there's a lot of Scripture here, and that's kind of the point of a survey. We want to survey Scripture concerning the truths. We want to make sure that our statement of faith is not defining what we understand about Scripture, but the Scripture is defining what we understand about our statement of faith, our faith and practice. Okay? And so that's one of the reasons that I read so much Scripture during these, these times of study. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 through 28. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true. They were, the, the, what we see in the Old Testament pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was types and shadows. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood uh, of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation." It's important to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ only had to do that atoning work on the cross by shedding His blood, obeying God's will to the cross. He only had to do it one time. What power? What power is that? I read somebody recently that said the Lord Jesus Christ's death is, is something that is unimaginable as He took on the sin of all those that the Father has given to Him. So we're talking about an innumerable amount of people. Can you imagine being condemned to a hundred lashes for one other person's sin? And you receive those 100 lashes. That would be horrible. Now imagine receiving a hundred lashes for a thousand men. We probably wouldn't survive it, would we? That's unimaginable. Now, take that and apply that to all whom the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died for. It doesn't even compute. It's, it's, it's un, 
intelligible to my finite mind. But that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did as He executed His priestly office in atoning for our sin. The Apostle Paul says in chapter 3, verse 24 through 26, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of, his, of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of them which believeth in Jesus. Again, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 9, but God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. W.R. Downing says, The Lord Jesus was both priest and sacrifice. He offered up to the Father His own lifeblood. By virtue of His perfect person and the infinite value of His sacrifice, He made a complete and full atonement for the sins of every believer. Very quickly, if there's anybody here that doesn't understand what the word atone or atonement means, it means that the wrath of God has been appeased and has been satisfied. Okay. The Lord Jesus Christ in His sacrifice satisfied the justice of God. As our high priest, as the Levitical priesthood did imperfectly, the Lord Jesus Christ ever makes intercession for us. So He continues in His priestly office. He pleads for us before the Father for His own sake and glory. Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14, "...seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession." For we have not an high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and, fi uh, and find grace to help in time of need. The Lord Jesus Christ communicates with God the Father our plight. I would like to continue on that, but I'm running out of time. The Lord Jesus Christ presents us before the Father perfect through Himself. And we find in Colossians chapter 1, starting verse 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, ye now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is our high priest and He has fulfilled that office perfectly, we are justified. We stand before God the Father covered by the blood of the Lamb. When we look back on the history of Israel, we are confronted with the fact, and, and let's, let's very quickly, I want to... I wanna, go through the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look back on the history of Israel, we are confronted with the fact that because of a lack of faith and trust in their God, they desired a king to subdue, rule, and defend them, as well as restrain and conquer their enemies. And there was never a king. There were good kings in Israel, but there was never a king that did this perfectly. In fact, the great majority of them failed miserably. However, when we, throughout the history of the Hebrews, throughout the history of Israel, we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we read God's revealed word concerning Himself and concerning His Son, we find that Jesus Christ is our perfect King. He alone is able to subdue our sinful hearts. He alone is able to rule over us perfectly. 
He alone is able to perfectly defend us against the onslaught of a sinful world. He alone is able to restrain and conquer the enemy. The wickedness of our own heart. The wickedness of the world that we live in. In Philippians chapter 2, and I go back to this a lot, I said this in the beginning. <laughs> I love this passage of Scripture. It, it just um, One thing you need to understand about the Apostle Paul, he was radically... His his Christology was radical, and that it was the center point, and that should be that way for us as well. We should be radical in our understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, who He is, and how that affects our lives. And I know sometimes that that's a bad word in the day and age we live, but that means that we should strive in every way, shape, form, manner to live as the Lord Jesus Christ lived. And to live as the Lord Jesus Christ continues to reveal to us through His Word that He wants us to live. But Philippians chapter 2, verse 9-11, through 11, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted and given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of being worshipped as King. Central to the doctrine of the Lord's mediatorial reign and kingship is the fact that, the, that He is the head of His church. That He is the King of His church. And some people talk about the, the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ as something that is only going to... that is something that is futuristic. It has not yet come. And I... I, I I can't say that. Uh, I don't know where everybody here is on their eschatology, but I can't say that. The Lord Jesus Christ reigns. Um, and He reigns over His church. This is, this is central. He is the head of the church. Eph- Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 22, going through verse 23, and hath put all things, Lord Jesus Christ, and hath put all things uh, uh, under His feet and gave Him to be uh, head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. Christ Jesus is not just King in the corporate sense as well. He's also King and Lord over the individual servant, the individual believer. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 4 and 6. In whom the God of this world hath blinded uh, the minds of them which believe not, lest the, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants uh, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts." to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He reigns over us individually. He reigns over His church. And as king, as prophet, as priest, as king, the Lord Jesus Christ has been exalted over all that is. As God, as Creator, as Savior, The Lord Jesus is sovereign over all that is. And He deserves our worship. He said this of Himself. We're not just making this up. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them. He's risen from the dead. He's getting ready to ascend. He's getting ready to give instruction concerning the Great Commission. And He says, All power is given unto Me in heaven and in earth. All power. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, "...who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. He is sovereign Lord. 
Our salvation is most assuredly held in place by our mediatorial Savior and King who's, who's sitting on the right hand of the Father is sovereign over all things. And the question came to my mind, what love is this? That we have been called to be servants of this so great a sovereign King. Knowing this, we must as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ worship Him in recognition of His place over us as mediator. All right, let's pray.